Hi, everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with Dr. Elliot Berlin of the Informed Pregnancy Podcast, all about chiropractic care during pregnancy and breech birth. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I have an exciting announcement to make. We have had so many people email and message us asking for a potential to order bulk copies of Babies Are Not Pizzas to hand out to their friends or their clients. And so I'm thrilled to announce that on January 20, we are going to open up pre-orders for bulk orders of Babies Are Not Pizzas. The bulk order period will last for one week only from January 20 through January 27. And you'll be able to order Babies Are Not Pizzas copies in sets of 10 for half off the list price. If you want to join in this pre-order, make sure you go to evidencebasedbirth.com slash book to get on the wait list for when the pre-order period opens. And now I am so excited to welcome our guest, Dr. Elliot Berlin to the Evidence Based Birth Podcast. Dr. Berlin is an award-winning prenatal chiropractor, childbirth educator, and labor support body worker. He is the co-founder of Berlin Wellness Group in Los Angeles, the podcaster at the Informed Pregnancy Podcast, and the executive producer of two documentaries about birth, Heads Up, The Disappearing Art of Breach Delivery, as well as Trial of Labor. Dr. Berlin also works with several hundred breech babies each year, most of whom turn into the ideal pre-birth position once normal function is restored to the mother's low back and pelvis. Dr. Berlin is also a labor support doula who attends births, providing laboring parents with body work such as massage, reflexology, acupressure, counterpressure, and chiropractic adjustments to help keep the birthing person relaxed, comfortable, and focused in an ideal mind and body condition for smooth, uncomplicated labor and birth. And Dr. Berlin attends labor at hospitals, homes, and birthing centers. Welcome, Dr. Berlin, to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me. Could you tell our audience a little bit about how you got into doing birth work as a chiropractor? Right. So that's a, that's a good question. As a kid, when people said, what do you want to do when you grow up? Doula was definitely not on my horizon. Um, but I was always interested in healthcare from the time I was little. I was maybe seven or eight years old and I saw a CPR class happening. And it just blew my mind when they explained what was happening that I could use my body to help somebody else sort of have a heart and lungs when there's were not necessarily working. And I think maybe a year or two later, I took a, a CPR class for myself and then first aid, then responding to emergencies. And eventually as a teenager, I was teaching for the American Red Cross. By the time I was 17, I started training as an emergency medical technician. By 18, I was working in ambulances and emergency rooms. And I was on my way to becoming some kind of medical doctor but when I was 19, unfortunately, my father passed very young, uh, partially from a medical mix-up, and it really kind of made me take a step back and look at healthcare differently. I still love the options for drugs and surgery, but I didn't want that to be my primary work. I wanted to see if I could work with the body to be healthy in other ways. And uh, I took a year to study lots of the different modalities, and I, I just fell in love with the combination of massage therapy and chiropractic together, addressing both sides of the musculoskeletal equation, and how when you improve that those structures, the body is better able to take care of itself. And so I went to school for both, and uh, it was soon after that, I, I during grad school, I was married already. My wife is a perinatal psychologist, and... She was in psychology school and I was in chiropractic and massage school. And then towards the end, when we tried to have our first baby, it was a very difficult go. We, we had a long fertility struggle and it wasn't until we stopped doing all the medical interventions. Pretty much they gave up on us and said we'd never have a baby. It was when we stopped doing all those interventions that we actually got pregnant. Um, thankfully, gratefully, and then pretty much every two years after that, another kid popped out. It was like hard to turn it off. So when we moved to Los Angeles, we just started a mind-body wellness practice that was sort of focused on general wellness, but also with an eye on boosting natural fertility. And um, 
I think it was in the first year we had several pregnancies, and every year after that, the number of pregnancies snowballed, and we found ourselves knee-deep in prenatal care. And one thing led to another, just a lot of of research uh, and trying to help with questions that would come in about different types of birth options or the stories that would come back after people had their babies. And very frequently, the journey seemed to go different than the plan. And um, we started to get involved in more education and, and trying to help better prepare people for the options that they would have through childbirth education and a blog that eventually turned into the other media. Uh, And then, you know, I got invited to my first birth. It was midway. Um, It was a home birth that had been going on for quite some time, and the baby seemed to be stuck. She was sort of stalled at nine centimeters for nearly nine hours. And the midwife just sort of called and said, do you think you could use body work to loosen up this pelvis a little bit so the baby can rotate into a better position. And I had no idea if I could do that, but I said I'm more than happy to give it a try. And things went really well there. And after a couple of hours of body work where things were just loosening up more and more, the baby clunked into a better position. You know, it was a moment when it happened. And then um, soon after that, she had the birth that she was looking for. So that was kind of my introduction to attending birth, and I just also snowballed from there, getting invited to other births where there were issues, whether it's spasms or back pain or babies that are rotated in a not ideal position or not coming down well, uh, and eventually to births where everything was going just fine and using body work to help relax the mind and body for a smoother experience. Not always uh, not always helpful to people, but for the people who it is helpful for, it seems to be very helpful. So that's amazing that you can attend births both as a doula and a chiropractor. Do you know of any other chiropractors who do that kind of work? I've only heard of a couple um, in my experience. Right. So I'm Southern California. I'm in Los Angeles. There's a school here and I'm an internship site for that school. So we've had several chiropractors come through my program and uh, learn the combination of massage and reflexology and cranial work that's in addition to what's normally taught in chiropractic school and how to apply it to pregnancy, birth, postpartum. And so several of those chiropractors bring this kind of work into, and they've become doulas as well. And they bring this kind of work into their doula support too. I was wondering too, if, if we could back up just a little bit and for people who are listening who might not be familiar with ch- chiropractic care, I know that it's often not part of the medical model in terms of, I know, for example, in my first pregnancy, I had a lot of back pain, a lot of pelvis pain, and my OB never once suggested that I see a chiropractor and I didn't even really know what they did. And then with my second birth, I had a midwife and that that was one of the first things she told me to do and it helped immensely. And I was introduced to this whole wide world. So could you explain and just, you know, briefly to our listeners who aren't familiar with that benefits of chiropractic care during pregnancy and kind of what it does. Sure. You know, at its core, chiropractors look at joints throughout the body. Wherever two bones come together, they form a joint. There should be good motion around that joint, not too much motion, not too little motion. And if sometimes because of various factors, the joint loses some of its mobility, it can start to create problems, either loss of range of motion where things become swollen, the things become rigid where you should have fluid movement. You sometimes have tight, rigid movement. And so what most chiropractors are doing is looking through the body for where the, there are restricted dysfunctional joints and restoring motion between the bones around the joint. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's lots of different ways to find the restrictions, lots of different ways to release them. But that's what most chiropractors have in common. So if you go to different chiropractors, you might find different approaches to how to find and release those joints. But what they're trying to do is improve skeletal function. Now, in addition to the actual structural issues, the spine in particular is supposed to protect the nerves and the spinal cord. And if it's not functioning well, not only does it sometimes not protect them, but it can create 
trouble for them. It can create pressure on them. And so you might feel pain. You might feel nerve pain, which is very intense. Um, or there could be other types of dysfunction. Those nerves don't only carry pain information. They par- carry information to and from the brain about what's going on in the body. So the bigger picture with chiropractic is if we can help alleviate issues in nerve communication, then we can help the body, which is the ultimate doctor, find and correct problems on its own in a way that it was having trouble doing before. In our case, we also incorporate soft tissue therapy to address muscles, tendons, and ligaments. When they're unhappy, they usually become short, stiff, tight, and during pregnancy, they can commonly also let's say, around the sciatic nerve, maybe from sleeping on your hips. If you're not used to it, those muscles in your low back hips and glutes get really stiff and tight and start to compress the outer bundle of the sciatic nerve, creating a kind of pregnancy sciatica that you just feel locally. It doesn't go all the way down the leg. That's one of the most common things that comes into the office, but it's easy to treat if we can release the muscle that's compressing that nerve and restore motion to the joints around it. Um, people usually get a lot of improvement from it, and it, you don't have to do it very often. You know, It's not like you have to come back three times a week. It lasts for a while. So generally speaking, some of the symptoms that come up during pregnancy, whether it's headaches or rib pain or low back pain or sciatica or sacroiliac pain, groin pain is pretty common, pubic symphysis pain. Sometimes it's at the wrists or in the legs or at the feet. Those are the kind of things that are fairly easy for for chiropractors to treat. But in terms of positioning and readiness for birth, if the low back, hips, and pelvis are really stiff, tight, and rigid, it makes it an environment that's reasonably more difficult for a baby to move around in, to maybe settle into an ideal position prior to birth or to kind of rotate and drop through the pelvis during birth. So part of our work in improving the musculoskeletal structures on the expectant mother is to make an easier transition for both the laboring person and the baby during childbirth. And some chiropractors are specially trained or have special experience in that kind of prenatal and preparation for labor and birth care, correct? Absolutely. So in chiropractic school, it's covered. Prenatal is covered. But uh, in my experience, it's not covered that well. It's kind of how a massage approaches it. Massage schools often approach prenatal as a list of things not to do. Uh, but there's so much more to prenatal massage that you can do. And same with chiropractic. It's a, it's oftentimes a list of don't do this, don't do this, modifications maybe. But it's not like how can we use these powerful tools for the pregnancy. It's how can we not do harm during the pregnancy, which is important, but we can go a lot deeper than that. So anybody who's who's licensed chiropractor has some training and can work on on pregnant people. But it's, there is a lot of postgraduate training available, especially through the ICPA, the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association. And I think that when you look at people who spend postgraduate time studying, furthering their education in this field, they're going to be the people who attract uh, pre- and postnatal clientele and ultimately get a lot of experience, which counts for the most. You know, the more experience you have, the more you learn, the more you can help somebody. So tell us a little bit uh, about your own birth experiences, if you feel comfortable. I know you had multiple children, but was there, Mm -hmm. and after a difficult journey with infertility, did the birth go smoothly or did you have problems with the healthcare system or how did that go? Uh, Our first pregnancy, again, I come from a very medical background, emergency rooms and ambulances, and um, the holistic side of things really came to me somewhat during chiropractic school and massage, but I I still was fairly medically minded uh, when we were pregnant with our first. And so was my wife. Uh, Her father also was actually, at the time, was a paramedic, and we volunteered together for a community-based ambulance organization. So we both came from a pretty medical background. We did the standard thing, go to a doctor at a hospital and, uh, you know, the typical visits, and they were fine. You know, our pregnancy was thankfully very healthy, and um, our labor and delivery plan was to just go to the hospital and have a baby, whatever that meant. My wife was not too keen on the idea of having a big needle next to her spinal cord. 
And so she had this goal to not have an epidural, um, not necessarily for holistic reasons, but just not in love with that visual. And so we, we hired a doula who was amazing. She was an incredible source of information and support during the pregnancy. And once labor started, it was, um, it was pretty cool. We labored at home for a long time. It was a, it was a long first birth. It was somewhere around 42 hours. And um, we did a lot of it at home together. And uh, uh, we were at the hospital for about 13 hours. And the original doctor who came by, it, it was an HMO group. So it's not like your doctor that you see all pregnancy long is necessarily going to be there. But they have multiple doctors on the floor. And so the original doctor seemed pretty medically minded. And because labor had been going on for a while, was pretty interested in interventions. Our doula realized that wasn't a great match at the moment and asked if there was another doctor available. And the other doctor who came in seemed just um, more aligned with what, what we were trying to do. And my wife was incredible and the doula was incredible and I was in awe and doing my best to be just somehow useful. And uh, she plowed through it. She was able to do the unmedicated birth and and uh, it was just very, very surreal, the whole thing. Incredible. The second baby at the same hospital uh, came a lot faster. So the whole labor was just over two hours. And I think we we're at the hospital for about 20 minutes before she came out. So there wasn't a whole lot of time to do any kind of intervention. And then the third was a little bit longer. And at a different hospital where they were much more keen on intervention. And by that point, we had become a lot more holistic. My wife and I were both had done doula training, were attending births. And just holistic from the point of view of don't intervene if we don't need to. And this particular doctor and hospital were, were just a different model. You know, intervene early and often to control things. And it's not that that's a good or a bad model, it just wasn't a good fit for us at the time. And so by the time we had our fourth, we decided to have a home birth and we found a midwife who we loved and it was just a great chemistry. And that birth was pretty short, about 90 minutes, start to finish at home, a beautiful home water, water birth. And it was, you know, I would say they were all pretty magical and we didn't have any bad experiences, but we did go through kind of this progression in terms of almost like what you said, how your original doctor was one model and then your midwives were a different model. And I think that one or the other model probably appealed to people. One appeals more than the other to people and maybe different model at different times or for different births. But for us, I feel like we got pretty, pretty lucky in terms of nobody really forced anything on us. And also we were fortunate to have just pretty healthy pregnancies and births without anything coming up that would, you know, put us in a position to have to make decisions about big interventions. That's wonderful. So you had relatively smooth labors and births. Um, can you talk a little bit about the struggles, though, that some of your clients are facing around perhaps uh, maybe breech birth in particular and the lack of choices available there? Sure. So I was a breech baby in the 1970s, and I don't think they really realized that I was breech till towards the very end. And they didn't really seem to care that much that I was breech. Uh, it was at that time not an automatic given that you would have a cesarean birth. Today, things are different. I think that since the term breech trial came out in 2001, which had a conclusion that breech babies uh, have a better, um, st statistically significant, small but statistically significant, better outcome when they're born via cesarean than when they're born vaginally. It just seems like the option to deliver a breech baby vaginally disappeared around that time in the North America, at least. And so even though subsequent studies kind of indicate that for some people, vaginal breech delivery could be a great option. It's still not happening very much. And I think because of that, it's very hard for anybody to get trained adequately on how to attend breech births. In California, midwives who, who were still doing breech births and still very supportive, uh, a couple of years ago, it became removed from their scope of practice, so they're not allowed to anymore. And the doctors generally don't want to. So 
here in Los Angeles, there's still a few doctors and still a few hospitals that are supportive and you could get a, a vaginal breech birth if you wanted one and if you meet their criteria for safety. But the numbers are dwindling fast. And if you don't have the insurance that covers that or for other reasons couldn't see that particular provider, then you really have no options. And um, it's hard to watch that because sometimes, you know, if I see somebody who's, let's say, on their third baby and they have had two great vaginal births and would love to have another vaginal birth, she might be a great candidate for it, but she can't find support for it. Uh, sometimes I'll see someone having their first baby, and it's a Frank Breach baby. And uh, I know she's planning to have five or six kids. And it's, you know, it's it's part of the calculation is whether or not having the first baby via cesarean is going to affect her the rest of her reproductive history, um, health, or future. But it almost doesn't matter because it's hard to find support. So it's been pretty challenging, and um, I think the more that people become educated about their options, the more they want to have choices, but the choices are disappearing nonetheless. So do you get a lot of like frantic phone calls from people who find out at the end of pregnancy that their babies breach and they come to you for help with uh, chiropractic care? Yeah, practically every day. And I think that chiropractic care can be helpful. There's a lot of different causes, I think, of breech babies. Some of them are structural, some of them could be functional, and some are a combination of both. And sometimes we never know. But if there's, you know, let's say a high up placenta with a short cord, I'm not sure that chiropractic is going to be very helpful. If the placenta is right in the baby's face, if the fluid's really low, if you have a large baby deeply wedged into the pelvis, not head down since week 20, there are some structural things that can work against us. You know, what we do is we don't manually try to move the baby. We don't we don't try to turn the baby. We just try to make a more functional space around the baby. So, you know, if towards the middle of pregnancy, somewhere around 50% of babies are not head down yet, but then all of a sudden by 32 weeks, 90% of babies are head down, it seems that as they run out of space, they have to pick a position and they typically turn head down. If that's not happening, there's generally some sort of explanation as why it's not happening. And to the extent that stiff, tight, rigid pelvis, lower, lower body, plays a role, we can start to loosen that up and perhaps make it more inviting or make the body be able to better accommodate or facilitate the movement. Um, so that's what we do. And I would say that sometimes babies turn after our visits or between our visits. Uh, doctors who do the external cephalic version where they manually try to move a baby, several of them send their clients to us to try what we do first, uh, either in hopes that it'll work or in hopes that it will at least soften the playing field so they have a better chance of success during the medical procedure. So that's kind of what we do. I would say I think in the opening, you might have said that most, you know, of the babies that we see turn, I would say many, uh, many of them turn and some of them don't turn. And when do you recommend that people start kind of figuring out what position their baby is in, knowing that there's so many restrictions around breech vaginal birth in North America? Um, you know, when should people start paying attention to the position of their baby? I like to know at 32 weeks. According to statistics that I read recently, 32 weeks, about 90% of babies are head down. At birth, about 96 to 97% are head down. So at 32 weeks, you still got a really good shot of the baby turning, even if we don't do anything. But time starts to really work against you then. So if you're in that 10% that's still not head down, it's a great time to explore your options for things you can do to try to help naturally encourage the baby to get head down. If you make it further into the pregnancy, there are going to be some choices if, if you want to medically try to turn the baby, how that's done, when that's done, if it's done with or without drugs and which drugs are used. There's a lot of information to accumulate in a short period of time. And then, of course, if the baby stays breech and you need to have breech delivery options, you know, which options are available to you in your area. Or I can see people traveling large distances to be able to get to a provider that can help them. That's all stuff that 
that takes time. So I think 32 weeks is a time when, since the majority of babies are head down at that point, it's a good time to know, is your baby head down or not? You know, how big is your baby? What kind of fluid do you have? Uh, is there any known variation in the shape of the uterus is that might be contributing uh, where's the placenta just things to be aware of uh, are there people in your area that can help with holistic modalities like chiropractic massage acupuncture and moxibustion um, homeopathic um, hypnotherapy there's a lot of different things that can be used to try to help encourage the the baby to flip into the ideal position um, and to explore the options in case it doesn't happen. And if it doesn't happen and the baby remains breech, um, what is it like for your clients in, in that situation? You know, for, for some of them, they're totally okay with it. You know, some clients don't, don't really even do the medical procedure, the external cephalic version, to try to turn the baby because they are of the philosophy that if the baby's breached, there's a reason for it and let's not mess with it too much. Some of them don't particularly care for the option to deliver babies that are breached vaginally and they're okay. And even then, I think it's great to study what happens during a cesarean and so it shouldn't be so scary and intimidating. And there are also choices to make during a cesarean birth, especially a scheduled cesarean birth, that uh, people are probably not that aware of until they get there. So for that reason, it's also kind of nice to study ahead of time. For other patients, it's much it's a much bigger deal. People who are uh, very opposed to medical, you know, pharmaceutical interventions, surgical intervention, people who are sometimes just terrified of um, surgery, people who um, trust in their bodies and are good candidates, generally considered good candidates for vaginal birth, but can't find a provider. It's kind of, it's, it can be really devastating and traumatic. Yeah. We had somebody on the podcast who was in that situation who they told her that there were no providers available to do a breech vaginal birth. And turns out there was, I just didn't, the hospital staff didn't know that there was somebody that could be called and uh, was very traumatic for that, that person, that parent. Also, I've also seen, you know, obviously it's great if you have the benefit of the advanced knowledge of knowing that your baby's breached so that you can educate yourself about all of your options for either turning the baby or, you know, the type of delivery you have. But I also know there's situations where there's a surprise at the very end, can you talk a little bit about, you know, if the baby's coming out, if mom's in labor and all of a sudden it's discovered that the baby is breech? Well, uh, I think what generally happens is a state of panic. So in our film, we had, it wasn't exactly that scenario, but we interviewed a mom who found out towards the end, she was planning for a natural birth, found out towards the end that she was breech. And she wasn't given many options in terms of trying to turn the baby. They just scheduled a cesarean for 39 weeks. But before her, her 39 week cesarean date, she went into labor and she progressed really quickly. And so by the time she got to the hospital, the baby was pretty much coming down, uh, Frank breach. So, I'm pretty sure it was Frank breach, but first. And so, you know. Which is the most the, ideal position for a breech baby, correct? In terms of safety, yeah, if you're going to deliver a breech baby, in terms of safety and ease coming down Frank breach, you know, the butt will block the cord from coming out first to, to prevent one of the concerns of vaginal breech birth, which is umbilical cord prolapse. If the cord comes through first and then the baby comes through, then the cord can get compressed and then it could be a serious complication. But just like a head blocks the cord from coming through first, so does when the butt's wedged in there, it does as well. Um, but they just panicked. They hadn't seen vaginal breech birth before the providers who were there. They didn't really know what to do. And, and what they did is they kicked her husband out and they knocked her out completely so that labor would stop. And um, according to the op report, they pushed the baby back in and did a cesarean birth. Uh, and she was very traumatized by that. And even with her second baby, she that's which is when I met her, she was not breech, but 
she was very nervous about having a vaginal birth because she thought the same thing would happen to her again, that she'd totally lose control. She has no memory of her first birth. Um, her husband wasn't allowed to be there. There are no pictures. She was knocked out completely. Um, and that's the kind of panic that sometimes happens because younger providers don't have any experience now, oftentimes, with delivering breech babies. And I think it, it's it's a problem. I think it's sad, especially in those scenarios where things are going very well. Um, we also, on our podcast, we have a story of uh, someone who was breached and she was planning to, she tried everything. She did all the holistic things. We did chiropractic and acupuncture and massage and she did the external version, which also didn't work. And so she was set to meet one of the doctors here locally who delivers breech babies vaginally, but her water also broke before they had that meeting. And so she went into the hospital and her doctor was apologetic. He said, I just, I don't know. I don't know how I'm not comfortable. I don't feel like I can do it for you safely. And so she had a cesarean birth, which went well and she recovered well. It was better than she thought it was going to be in a rare repeat episode because nobody knows why her first baby was breached. There's no real identifying reason for it. But her second baby was also breached, and she she started really early at 24 weeks, noticing it and trying to do things to help encourage a turn, and that baby also wouldn't turn. But in a very unusual case, she found a doctor who was comfortable doing a vaginal breech birth after cesarean. So sometimes it's hard to find a VBAC all by itself, a plain old vaginal birth after cesarean. It's typically hard to find a doctor to deliver a breech baby vaginally. In her case, she was able to find a doctor who delivered her breech baby vaginal birth after cesarean. And she had a great experience. And I noticed at your website, informedpregnancy.com, if people click on watch, there is a section called Breach Stories where you, there's a collection of all of the breech birth stories on your podcast. Yeah, absolutely. And there's an easy way to get to that, too, is breachpodcast.com. We get so many requests for information since the film came out. We get so many requests for information that we just took all of our breach podcast stories and articles about uh, and stories that people submit about their own breach experiences and our film heads up and just put it all in one easy to access place. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your film. What inspired you to create a documentary about breach birth? Well, it's just what what I kind of live through and witness every day with with people panicking towards the end of pregnancy, not having information and not having options. I'm quite pro choice when it comes to childbirth. I think that if somebody who doesn't need a cesarean birth but wants to have one, I think she should we should support that in, in today's day and age. She should be given all of the pros and cons of the different options available to her, and we should support that. And I feel the same way about vaginal birth. I think that it's very, it's not really a problem. Anybody who wants to have a cesarean birth really has access to it. But oftentimes people who want to have a vaginal birth don't. And so we made heads up to sort of tell that story and to kind of put a more human side. I think sometimes doctors don't realize the toll it takes emotionally and psychologically on somebody who really, really, really doesn't want to have a cesarean birth and finds out that they're a pretty good candidate for a vaginal birth. And the only reason they can't have one is because they can't find a provider who will do it. And so I wanted to sort of give a little more insight to what that's like sometimes for people emotionally. And also at the same time to highlight that this could be an option for somebody. For somebody who doesn't even know that it's an option, uh, you know, we show a pretty close up Frank Breach birth towards the end of the film. And sometimes when people watch that, their minds are blown. In fact, we sometimes get invited to Grand Rounds at, at a hospital and do a presentation for both obstetricians and residents. And sometimes they'll see it. And it's the first time they've seen a vaginal breech birth. And they're kind of blown away by it, like how just normal, natural it can look. So, you know, I think any way you give birth, there's always going to be some risk. There's different risks involved with vaginal breech birth than with head down vaginal birth or with cesarean breech birth. And our goal is to sort of help inform somebody about 
the different known pros and cons, risks and benefits to each option, both for them and their baby, and put them in a position where they can make an empowered choice, an informed choice, and then support the choices that they make. And I think that goes really well with the title of your podcast, you know, the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Although, Mm -hmm. as you mentioned, one of the big barriers to choice is not having providers who are trained in offering choices. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, since the documentary came out, have you seen any changes in a positive direction in terms of providers getting training or relearning this lost skill of breech vaginal birth? So here in Los Angeles, there were, which is, you know, my immediate community, there were two positive changes. One is a doctor who has always done vaginal breech birth. He's always supported vaginal breech birth. He has some criteria that are important to him that that people meet for safe vaginal breech birth. But he's, he's always done it and never publicized it. So after the film came out, several people said, oh, do you know this doctor does vaginal breech birth? And so I reached out to him and I showed him the film. We went out for dinner and, and talked a little bit. And he agreed that it would be okay to tell people that he does it and that they can come consult with him towards the end if they find themselves in that position. And uh, I've sent dozens and dozens of clients to him since then. And, you know, they don't always choose to go through with it, but at least they can have a consultation with somebody and and have a choice. And oftentimes they they do go through with it. And so that's been a, a great resource here locally. There was another doctor who saw the film and he kind of got up to ask some questions and I thought that he was going to give me a hard time and be negative about the film and he wasn't. It was uh, towards the end of the film we do show a side by side of I think a pretty fair choice for a what's a home vaginal breech birth and a cesarean birth with a person who did not have a breech baby, but did allow filming, and the hospital also allowed filming, which is sometimes hard to get, of her cesarean birth. And she's happy. She's not angry. She's not, she didn't want to have that vaginal birth. She wanted to have an out-of-hospital birth. She didn't want to have that cesarean birth. She wanted to have an out-of-hospital birth, but it turned into a cesarean birth, and she's happy. And that's what he pointed out. He said, although sometimes... I think residents and doctors feel threatened by that side by side and and feel like it's not a fair representation. He got up and he said, you know, I've, I've been to a lot of cesarean births and I feel like you picked a fair cesarean birth to put side by side with that vaginal birth because sh- she's she's excited and she's happy to be having the baby and she's smiling and she's she's not screaming. And he was touched by that. He was touched by the whole film and even though he's younger, he had some experience with vaginal breech delivery from an older doctor. He's one of those younger doctors who, when he was uh, new, really sought out the experience from the older doctors, which is rare. I think today most most of the younger doctors are not interested. Um, and he became another source of vaginal breech birth. We actually have another another vaginal breach after cesarean episode with him on the podcast, a totally different story. So those are two of the local positive things that came out. Um, Another thing that I think that's positive that came out is more and more consumers, more and more pregnant people uh, are aware that that this could be a choice. And so they're more vocal uh, with their doctors and providers. And I see, especially with the HMO, they're sometimes demanding that the HMO pay for them to go out of the network because they're not offering the service that they need. And sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not successful. But you know, if an HMO doesn't offer a service that you need, then there's this gap exemption coverage where they're supposed to pay for you to go get it someplace else. So sometimes they argue that this is not a necessary procedure, vaginal birth, and sometimes they seem to be willing to accommodate. So, and ultimately, I think that if there's going to be a change, that's how it's going to happen. It's that the consumers are going to demand change, and then it'll eventually take place. I think it also motivated the film, to a degree, motivated some of the people who do go around the country teaching breech birth, Um, Unfortunately, they kind of have to teach from video libraries and on simulators because there's just not that much vaginal breech birth happening 
for young providers to witness. Although the one guy who re reemerged and said we could publicize that he does vaginal breech birth, he always asks the laboring person if they mind if extra people come into the room and witness it. And at his hospital, people really do seem to be interested, nurses and residents and doctors do seem to be interested in at least having some exposure to it. So the signs are not huge. The changes are not pos uh, the positive changes are not monumentous. They're not big changes, but they are small changes. The problem is that as time goes on, it's the older doctors and midwives in some states that have the most experience uh, that start to retire and stop practicing. And I think that's happening at a faster rate than younger practitioners being trained. And so the net shift is not amazing. Well, that's why it's even more important that you did the documentary, though, to, to raise awareness to this issue before the option disappears completely. It really struck me when you talked about the doctor who originally didn't want to publicize the fact that they did vaginal breach birth. I have seen that across the country among the handful of clinicians I know who attend breach vaginal births. They are similarly, they don't want to draw attention to it because I think many of them feel like they're, they're trying to practice under the radar. Perhaps, you know, hospital administrators, other OBs are willing to kind of turn a blind eye as long as it's just one vaginal breach birth here or there. But if they got a flood of people coming to them for vaginal breach births, they're worried about the pushback from the hierarchy and the, the power hierarchy in the hospital. Right. And so I, I think that if the statistically there's around three or four percent of their clients are going to be breached at the very end. And most of them are not going to request a vaginal breach birth anyway, then they would only be doing them once in a very blue moon and they could fly under the radar. But there was a local hospital that the head of obstetrics invited us to do a presentation and we presented the film. There was another doctor who does go around the country teaching breach who did a presentation showing a whole bunch of different uh, videos of breach birth and explaining what to look for. And there had been several doctors in that hospital who had some experience with breach birth and they kind of agreed as a team that they're going to try to try to make this option available to the community and always have somebody on who's comfortable with vaginal breach delivery. It only went on for a few weeks. It was like a few weeks later they had two or three in a row and one of the hospital administrators caught wind of it because it kind of made a wave. Um, they were all great births, but that administrator just didn't like the optics of it and made it really impossible for them to continue attending vaginal breech birth. So I understand why people want to, providers want to kind of fly under the radar because they may lose the, the option altogether if they attract too much attention. Which is just crazy <laughs> when you think about it. It's like, we're giving people options, you know, that's terrible. <laughs> Stop that. I know. I mean, that's the crazy thing about VBAC, which is a whole other genre, but it's, it's our other movie is that you know, VPAC is essentially the absence of a procedure. And women who don't have access to a VBAC are just begging for no intervention. They're, and and a, a hospital that bans VBAC is banning the absence of a procedure. It's kind of mind boggling. It's in other words, they're saying we're forcing you to have this baby with intervention, which seems very un American, just not the kind of thing that happens in a free country. So Dr. Berlin, do you have any advice or suggestions for how people can educate themselves more about breech birth? Well, I generally think for individuals who are going to have a baby or are currently pregnant, I think it's good to find out at 32 weeks what's going on with your baby. Not just what position the baby's in, but is your baby measuring on the smaller, medium, or larger side? Is your placenta maybe on the front wall, anterior, where maybe it gets in the way a little bit more? Is your fluid, fluid, normal range for fluid is a big range. So is your fluid on the low, middle, or higher range of normal? Anything we can tell about the cord? Just things that if your baby's not head down, more intel so you know what you have to work with. I think that in terms of options and choices for both things you can do to encourage a baby to get head down or 
things that you options that are available to you if the baby doesn't turn into a head down position, both in terms of vaginal birth and cesarean birth. We try to put together all of that at breachpodcast.com. And I just think it's important early on to have these conversations with your provider because you don't know if it's going to be you until you get to the very end. And then there's not a lot of time to react to it. So in general, I think that when you're finding your birth provider, if it's a medical doctor or midwife, to really just ask these questions more towards the beginning. What if my baby is measuring large? What if my baby is in a breech presentation? What kind of options will I have available to me? Thank you so much for that advice. Dr. Berlin, do you have any questions you want to pick my brain about? Is there anything I can help you with today? I mean, I have so many questions that I want to pick your brain about, and I'm hoping that you'll come on to our, our podcast, Inform Pregnancy, several times. But I know that you are approaches evidence-based birth, and so I would just maybe turn it around for a second and say, from your research, in terms of somebody who has a breech baby and their options to deliver from the evidence-based side, what, what information could you offer? So we have just a couple of resources at Evidence Based Birth about breech babies. We have not published an article about vaginal versus cesarean birth and that option. However, we do have an article about the use of external cephalic version for turning a baby, the research evidence on that. And you can find that at evidencebasedbirth.com slash breech dash version. V-E-R-S-I-O-N. We have in the article some statistics about, you know, how often breech babies are born. And uh, we pulled those from the birth certificates in the United States and have some tables and info about the success and failure rate of you know how often are versions successful in turning a baby and you know what's the cesarean rate if you attempt version versus if you don't. And then we have research on the effectiveness of versions and what increases your chance of the version being successful in turning the baby head down as well as what are the risks. We talk about pain and timing and techniques that can increase the likelihood of success, as well as like a long bullet point list of things that can increase or decrease the chances of the version being successful. We even have a little section about VBAC and version because sometimes mm. people who have a scar on their uterus from a prior cesarean and they're hoping to have a vaginal birth with the second baby and then Unfortunately, they find out the baby is positioned breech. Sometimes, at least in my community, but I've also heard this in other communities, their providers will refuse to do a aversion to manually turn the baby if there's a scar in the uterus. So we talk a little bit about the available research on that, which there's not much, but there are a couple of studies and there are also guidelines on that from ACOG. ACOG's official stance is that people who have had previous cesareans are not le any less likely to have a successful version, um, but they should be counseled that the risk of uterine rupture with version has not really been well studied. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that there's that article. And then the other thing we do have, we do have a blog article about milk sebustion for turning a breech baby. You can just Google the evidence on milk sebustion, which is an acupuncture Chinese medicine technique. So those are the two resources we offer. I mean, that's incredible because I think that what happens is when you have a provider that wants you to go a certain way, that would like for you to make a certain choice, the information is presented in a way that will influence you towards that choice. So even for VBAC, if somebody says the risk of uterine rupture is one half of 1%, to most people that, that sounds pretty low and like a risk they're willing to take. But if you turn it around and say one in 200, which is the same thing, all of a sudden, it sounds like a much bigger number. Like, I know 200 people. If my odds are winning the lottery or one in 200, I would jump on that ticket right away. And so I think that the way we process risk is pretty interesting, but the way we're fed risk is more interesting. So I frequently hear people say, I'm not going to do the external version because it's so risky. But I can't wait to read through your 
articles on it because I like to just present to somebody, these are the actual risks and let you decide if that's a risk you want to take. I think that risky and safe are somewhat subjective terms. And so that's why I love your stuff in general. And with your permission, I'm going to link all that stuff to our Breach podcast page. Oh, definitely. And also the article is free to the public all about the evidence on external cephalic version for Breach Baby. But I will also send you a printer friendly PDF that our members have access to so that you can print that off and hand it out to your clients. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Blinn, for coming on the podcast. I know people can follow you on your podcast, the Informed Pregnancy Podcast, which is available on iTunes and everywhere else, and your website, informedpregnancy.com. Is there anywhere else people can follow you on social media? We have everything on Instagram, and it's at Dr. Berlin, all spelled out, D-O-C-T-O-R-B-E-R-L-I-N. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Berlin, for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on this episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to Dr. Berlin and hearing his thoughts about breech birth and chiropractic care. I know for me, it was really informative. Just a reminder that the opportunity to order bulk copies of Babies Are Not Pizzas will open January 20 and be open for one week only through January 27. And if you want to get on the wait list for those bulk book pre-orders, just go to evidencebasebirth.com slash book. Thanks everyone. And I'll see you next week. Bye.